day, everyone, and thank you so very much for being a part of our show in our series of Creative Juneteenth 2022. So again, this is Dejan Sneed here, and I'm thankful that you are taking your time and opportunity to be a part of our showcase of a diaspora of talent where we're celebrating the creative freedoms here on the Juneteenth holiday. And with that, we are also looking at creative expression as we do with creativity, technology and community. But we want to speak to something that's very near and dear to our hearts and in a space of passion as well as purpose. And that is the space of gaming. And so gaming just more than being players, but how do we become agents of our own success in these spaces? And I'm extremely excited to bring on uh, a, a great guest as well as a uh, fantastic representation of, of what we want to see. So with that, I'm just calling immediately here to the stage, uh, Timmy Afalabi, uh, with both, both teams to score and also a a part of the Global Expansion, Expansion Incubator with Xbox. So Timmy, good day to you and thank you so very much for being part of our Creative Gen Z program. How are you doing today? I'm great. Um, thank you, Dedra, and thanks for having me. Um, really looking forward to this. Um, like I said, I, I think what you guys are doing is really great, and um, I'm quite honored to that you would think my, you know, my opinions on this are worth sharing with your larger group. So, yeah, really looking forward to this, and um, great to be here. Thank you so very thank much. You. Oh, no, the pleasure is ours. So with that, you know, not only just your, your opinion, but your example of doing the work in gaming as well as gaming in on the continent, which for a lot of our our community is is a space of appreciation and one of, of great interest. So I want to just just part of this to say love. Just want to let you introduce yourself and give a little bit more of your background. Where are you and, and what are the the you know? Well, let's just get started from there. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, who am I? Um, my name is Temi Afalabi. I'm a Nigerian. Um, I've lived here most of my life. I lived in the UK for a little bit. I went to school there for a bit, but I've moved back. I've been back here for about 10 years now. Um, so I went to school actually originally as a lawyer, but, um, you know, I was, as a kid, I was really big on games and sports. That was always my, so I was the kid that was breaking things in the house, playing soccer. I'm only saying soccer because I'm talking to you guys, playing football. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that went on for a while. And um, so I knew I felt like I always wanted to do something involved with gaming or sports. But being African and, you know, I'm sure some of some some of you guys to a lesser degree might have the same experience where your parents feel like you should do something that's safe, that's reliable to get a job and all that. So I ended up studying law and being a lawyer. And um, so I did that for a while. And then... Um, but a few years into that, I started this platform, sports media platform called Both Teams to Score. And it was really just like um, Bleacher Report, really. I just thought Bleacher Report was really cool. I'm going to post the nicest pics I can find, write really cool and witty captions. Um, I guess the initial idea of my brother was for our captions to be very hip hop related. So you'd read a caption and you see like rap music references or whatever. And people really liked that and they gravitated towards it. And then, um, and like I said, I was a gamer as well. So during the pandemic, we were all stuck in the house for a while. And then I thought, um, I play a lot of FIFA. And I was talking to my brother and I was like, you know, we have all these followers in BTTS. I'm sure a lot of them play FIFA as well. Why don't we try and play a pro clubs tournament and make it as big as we can? And um, so we put it out on the page, people sign up. And then we got like over 200 players from like Canada, the United States, England and Nigeria which was, you know, crazy. Like, there was a lot of people who were playing at the same time. They had headsets. So there was a bit of community involved. It was like a month long because it was a whole league and a knockout. Com and what I found about that, which I already knew, is gaming, like other forms of entertainment, is a big source of, you know, creating community. Like, so we'd have a group chat. People would talk every day. You know, people would brag. People bragging rights and all that. And it just became really, really interesting. And um, so after that, um, after that tournament, um, some people who worked at Xbox, who I happen to know, saw the tournament, saw how successful it was, how big a deal it was. And, it, and they were like, um, we've got this expansion role over at Microsoft. Would you be interested in applying to this? And obviously, I like I said, I was a keen gamer, but over here in for us over in Africa, you don't really you want to play PlayStation, Xbox, all these things, but you don't really imagine working there. I didn't have any friends that worked at Xbox. I knew one person really that worked at Microsoft, but not even Xbox. So it was sort of an opportunity that I didn't even realize was there. 
Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then, so I applied for the job and, you know, went through the interview process, did the research. Um, obviously my enthusiasm came through because I had a lot of, so even though I didn't have, um, formal experience in the industry, I had a lot of informal experience, which is always my advice to people. If you're passionate about anything, just try and do something about it yourself. So with BTTS, it wasn't really like something we were doing for profit. Like I think we'd made some t-shirts one time just to sell some merch. We'd like drawn paintings of iconic goals. People see those, buy those, but it wasn't something that was making us a lot of money at all. It was just a passion project. And um, even with the FIFA tournament, it was just how many people can we get to play? How much um, enthusiasm can we build? How much can we make this a thing? And, um, and it happened to be really successful. And then, I sort of got into the industry formally and um, now I'm now that I'm in the industry sort of looking at it from the inside it's it's really interesting it's a it's a different beast so to speak on the inside than the outside because on the outside you're just playing the games you know what's good what's not good on the inside when you see the process it massively massively increases your respect for you know, developers, game makers, um, just everyone across the industry. Because um, my role is sort of, again, it's global expansion. So it's like strategy, business development. I try and find new games, new developers, pitch it to our platforms and all that. And um, But the real heroes of all this, in my mind, are the creatives who are the um, game makers. And um, for me, I feel like as a young African, I have seen like how... Um, technology in different ways has technology and entertainment have added so much to our community in different ways. So I say that to say the people who aren't as privileged to, you know, go to these great schools and get these great jobs, you know, sometimes they have to do things that are, they have to find roles that are, you know, low hanging fruit, so to speak. So you might have, you might be easier to become an artist than become an investment banker if you have that talent. You know, not that it's easy to be an artist, but if you have that talent, there might be less barriers for you, so to speak. So I feel in this role, I've met a lot of, you know, young Africans that are sort of seizing this opportunity to sort of get in this industry. And with all the challenges in place in terms of investment, infrastructure, connectivity. And um, so I'm really proud of being in a position where my role is sort of taking responsibility for helping these people in any way we can. Um, that could be encouragement, it could be finance, and it could be marketing, it could be exposure. But I, my, I, for me personally, I want to see young Africans succeed in gaming the way we have in music or in how there are more Nigerian mu- movies on Netflix now. Mm-hmm. I want more African games on Game Pass or on PlayStation. I want it to be like normal to play a game that's set in an African village and it's not just, you get what I'm saying? So that sort of thing. So I guess I've been rambling for a while, but that's sort of the, that's sort of the vision. That's sort of how I got into it. Um, so I've been in it for most of this year is my first year officially in the industry. And, um, so right now it's mainly a lot of market research, trying to find out where we can plug and play, where we can help. Um, we come here with the, while I'm African, I'm Nigerian and Africa is 54 countries. So I have to find out, you can't just, Africa is not Nigeria. There's South Africa, there's East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, and they're all culturally unique. So currently we're just trying to find the, I'm trying to find the state of affairs in all these spaces, what developers here need, what developers here need, and how we can sort of meet them. Oh, sorry about that. No, <laughs> African no, no. But yeah, so that's where we at. No, that's a great introduction as well as insight as far as to where the, the larger scope of things are. So let me ask a, a point from there. What is the state of accessibility to tools and resources for developers as you see it, not only in Nigeria, but in the, the state of spaces um, around Africa? Okay, so I guess the, the answer to that would be it's improving, but it's not where it needs to be. So, um, like I said, with the tournament we ran, um, it was over a month long. And like I said, we had players in the UK and the US and they're playing a soccer game. So it has to be instant reactions for it to go properly. Right. And um, latency issues and all that. And we didn't really have any of those. Like there was maybe the odd game. We had over like 400 games played and maybe you had like four or five that there'd be a brief connectivity issue. So it wasn't perfect, but it was nothing to worry about at all. So in terms of just like internet connectivity, um, 
but some regions are more have more of that than others. So there's that. And then um, in terms of you know toolkits, access to you know dev kits to make games on certain consoles, that is not where it needs to be. But that's a big part of you know what we're doing or what we're trying to do. So find developers, give them these tools that they ordinarily either for pricing reasons or just proximity reasons can't currently get. So. Um, the answer would be it's trending in the right direction, but there's still a long way to go. There's still a lot. And that's why a lot of um, African game developers at the moment are working on mobile games because the barriers to entry are much lower. But um, again, it's improving. Um, and then regions matter. So in North Africa, perhaps they have a little more access to um, dev kits at the moment. Um, than maybe in West Africa. South Africa is, so the industry did about close to 600 million in revenue last year. South Africa did about half of that. Um, so I do think, yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely room for improvement. Um, yeah. Great. And now uh, you said something, and, and that was going to be your next question as far as mobile games as a, as a burgeoning space, just in general, right? So the idea is that most demographics have some type of intersection of mobile games, whether that's youth uh, to the young at heart uh, that, that knows no age limit. And so in developing those games, where have you seen some, some innovations for developers or just creating content as far as just the uh, current ecosystem that you're seeing? And with BTTS, was that a point of, of reference as far as bringing in those content and those content creators? What you mean in terms of um, mobile creators? Yes. Okay, so um, what what I would find, I, I can't speak as much to the innovations I'm seeing because, like I said, I started this year, so I haven't really seen an evolution just yet. Yeah. Um, I will say we're seeing a lot of, I'm getting a lot of encouragement from the fact that people are going to make these games regardless of the challenges. That's what's become clear to me. So people are, looking for the cheapest, easiest to find resources and making their games. But, um, but, and these are high quality games, right? So, um, it's games that are ready to be ported to consoles. Some of them we're talking to them now about porting to consoles for them. Um, and that might be, um, again, they might not have a porting studio nearby. It might be too expensive to port it and things of that nature. So, um, I think a big part of what I'm seeing is in Africa more so than in other regions, we're going to have to sort of lower our barriers to entry to sort of meet them halfway. Um, so I would say in terms of, but what I will speak to is the quality of the game. So the mobile games you see and you play them and you're like, this is brilliant. If this person had the right resources and the right amount of time and mentorship, they could be making AAA games. It's it's just obvious when, when you play the game. So um, I would say that, yeah, a lot of the mobile games are best in class, are as good as they can be. Um, there's, there's also a lot of PC gaming. Um, recently, I've been looking at the Middle East and North Africa and um, the quality of, you know, the games I'm seeing on Steam and things of that nature are, are really impressive. So I would say there's no, the quality gap is not what you would imagine from afar. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. So these guys really know what they're doing. And also, if I don't know if you know, but in Nigeria, we have, um, there's a massive culture of adopting new technologies. So in the financial technology space, FinTech, Nigeria might be ahead of the United States. Like I can do things with my mobile banking in Nigeria that people in England and the United States cannot do, like in terms of sending money to different people, how people need all these different apps to receive and send money. It is so smooth over here. So I say that to say um, Nigerians, I can speak to particularly, but overall Africans are very good at learning new technology because again, for a lot of them, it's also, a, it's a chance. It's a big opportunity. It's like, if I learn this crypto thing properly and create a platform, it's life changing. And also our population in Nigeria specifically is about 200 million. So on the basis of that, I think it naturally makes us very, one, you have a big market to sell to if you have a good idea. It's just 200 million people in the same country. So that encourages. And then I think the competition with the numbers forces innovation. Like 
the best ideas are going to come out because it's a very competitive space. So um, yeah, that that's what I that's what I see. No, that's that's beautiful, and and again, the sense of innovation being where you are is really what's been attractive as far as seeing the successes of. Right. Uh, many of the spaces in Africa, and of course, as you say, within Nigeria, I know that we it's well documented where that expertise comes into play. So, just from a community building standpoint, how are you seeing the whether those are tournaments? Because again, if things are more mobile in that sense, when you're looking at BTTS and and just your overall work, how is the community seen? In well, we can maybe speak to Nigeria if that's more you know mm -hmm. more in, intensive. Uh, in that space. So how are you seeing the, the space of tournaments and, and building communities around gaming? Oh, it is. Um, it's a great time for that. Um, there are a few platforms. I'll give a shout out to um, GamerX. Um, it's spelled Gamer without an E. They had a tournament in April. And um, the arena where they had it is usually for concerts for, you know, our biggest artists. Like, I don't know if you know David O, Wizkid, Burner Boy. This is a space where they sell out. And I was like, there's a gaming tournament there. Interesting. It was full, chock full. I was, I was shocked. Like it was full to the brim. There were loads of people. A lot of these people were coming to watch. Like a lot of these people weren't players. They were coming, there was a big screen and we had players from at least seven different African countries. So they'd all flown in and they were playing this massive tournament. There was Street Fighter, there was FIFA and there was all that. So it is that that's big. That's and it's only going to get bigger. And like I said, um, especially in Nigeria, because we're overpopulated anyway, it's not hard to fill places up. Like the the gaming community in Nigeria is just going to be a few a few million people just based on you know numbers. So um, so that was that was a big thing. Um, like I said, when we had our thing, we we were surprised because we thought we would send it to our group chats and we get a few groups of friends, maybe twenty to forty people, and then there's a sign up sheet and it's literally to and as of when they signed up, there was no prize money. It was just play to play. And it was 200 people. And then someone came in and was like, oh, we'll sponsor this. Uh, we'll give you some money to give to the winners. So then we got a bit of sponsorship after that. But again, a big part of this was it was all driven by passion. Like, we just wanted to do this. It was just fun, having fun with our friends. And that's a big part of the nature of gaming. Like, gaming is its own reward. Like, playing a game, having fun with your friends, winning, losing, going through it, getting better at a game. Um, the discipline to just all those things coming into play is so good at creating community. It's so, it's just natural. It's very natural. Um, and um, I think it's also become more, I don't know why, but it's become sort of become more trendy to be a gamer. I feel like back when I was growing up, it was sort of a niche group, um, just the gamers. But, but now it's like anyone and everyone is a gamer. And I guess that's an accessibility thing. And um, and you know, that's something we try to do over at Microsoft and, you know, reach every single gamer in the world. Like that's the long-term goal. So, um, so yeah, I think that in terms of building community, um, I had a meeting recently with some people from the French esports federation and they're looking at doing a lot in Africa with different governments because a lot of African governments are looking into this now, which is natural. Like esports is the next big sport. Like it's the next big frontier in sports. Like, so the same way you want to be at the Olympics and all this, eventually we're going to get there to, and you know, that's being recognized in Nigeria. That's being recognized in places like Egypt and Kenya, where the government and other people are investing have, and also, you know, big private telecoms business and all that are putting a lot of money into tournaments, um, bringing people together. Um, the prize money pools are increasing every year. As you would imagine, um, they're not as big as the international ones, but again, with for me with the gaming thing is feeling like you i've gotten in close to the bottom floor so i didn't get in at the beginning but it's pretty close to the beginning and in my mind you know 10 20 even maybe less years from now it's really going to be a big thing so i said it was 600 million in revenue last year it's going to be in the billions in no time and so on and so forth so um yeah the sense of community building esports tournaments um I think that's going to keep trending upwards. So the April one is definitely the biggest one I've attended. Mm -hmm. And um, the company behind that, um, you know, I've spoken to them and I know their plans and I know they're, you know, going to keep trying to get bigger and bigger and have some outside Nigeria. And, um, and also we're getting a lot of people in the industry to come and speak. 
So the day before the tournament, that was sort of a closed session and, you know, people could, people in the industry could share ideas, what we see, where we see this going in the next few years and so on. So yeah, a lot to be optimistic about. No, absolutely. And, and, and to your point uh, of having a chance to speak with Gamer X as, as well as some other spaces there, you know, we, we do see that there's a leadership space that's growing, not only there in, in, in Nigeria, but uh, among many spaces there in the continent. So with that, what should we be looking at as far as educating our, our upcoming developers, our upcoming designers, our upcoming community members? What are some spaces that you see that now we should really emphasize to help build that bridge of, of sustainability? As you're saying, you know, we're seeing the pots grow. We're seeing more of these events right. happen. We're, and being intentional for, if we just say Africa as, as, a, as a continent, where can we see the the bridge is being built, or I guess to say, really, what are the, the things that we should help navigate? Do you think it's education? Um, mm. where, where are some spaces? And that can look from both your space on all the things that uh, that come in your right now. Okay. Um, I think if there's a... I mean, one is, if you see an African game, play it, try it out. Um, that interest is interest is a big thing. Interest, revenue, things like that will always help naturally. Um, I think there's a big space for mentorship. Um, so, like I said, a lot of these people are self-taught. Like, so they're gonna watch a video on YouTube, or they're gonna whatever the case may be, and they're gonna learn themselves. So, um, we in Microsoft we have um, developer days where you know you talk to devs, you bring people from the company, and they speak to them, and um, so I would say uh, mentorship. Um, also, I think people need to a lot, a lot access to a lot of things needs to be democratized. So in the sense that um, maybe dev kits need to be cheaper or made more available. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the challenge is access, and access can be financial or proximity. So it's really breaking down as many of those barriers as possible. So if it's in terms of access, maybe do more um, free resources that people can learn on that people can make mistakes on without the because at the end of the day not everyone's going to get the opportunity to pitch a game to a big company right a lot of times you're going to have to make your game in-house yourself with a few friends and things like that so i think that's one thing um i think it's also important to give visibility so like i said you see a game you talk about it you tell your friends about it um there's that, there's word of mouth. Um, what else do I think? What else do I think there's room for? Um, that's a good question. Maybe, maybe some more outsourcing in the sense that um, there's a lot of talent in Africa in gaming that the demand for the talent might not be where it needs to be yet. So there aren't enough like studios hiring these people. If you're making games, a lot of times young developers in Africa have to have second jobs because developing alone is not going to put food on your table. Or they go and gamify an app for some financial company, which is a game, but it's not, you know, a game in the sense that we're talking about. So, and I know, or I feel like there are other regions like India, for instance, where people sort of outsource the devs um, people in the United States and other places outsource some work to devs and get it back. So maybe we need to do more of that just to support people. That would keep more developers afloat in the sense that um, they could make money for doing jobs for other people, which would improve their skill sets. And at the same time, you have enough money to work on the game you actually want to make, right? So yeah, there's that. And um, so yeah, that and interest. Like um, a lot of a lot of African game makers at the moment when they're making something um, big, so when they're making a game that they feel, okay, I might be able to sell this to Xbox or Sony or whatever, they um, feel the need to have strong African undertones or storytelling underneath. I'm beginning to realize that. So people want to, because hey, if you're making a game, it's like making a movie. If you're going to share it to the world, you want them to know about your culture, about where you're from and how things go there. So I would say, um, the rest of the world sort of needs to show more interest in that. And hey, at the end of the day, if the games are good, people are going to play them, right? But um, I suppose we could have more of an eye out for supporting African talent. So if you see a game and it's set in Egypt, oh, okay, I'm going to play that. Let me see. Let me see what stuff is like in Egypt. Um, those plays on the platforms, 
that's um, positive feedback for the developer. It's encouragement. It makes him more likely to get a proper investment if his game's actually being played, being reviewed on Steam, getting positive reviews. So I think it's just being deliberate about, if you want to support, it's about being deliberate about supporting in any way you can. So it's about going to find games. It's about um, hiring people when you can. It's about, do you have more dev kits than you need? Um, can you partner with, do you know people in Africa that you can partner with to give out these dev kits? Um, and then do you have time to run a mentorship program of your own? Do you want to make yourself available to, um, so if there's a team of African devs, you can say, okay, I mean, you can't be available to everyone, but you could find, Hey, these guys are working on this game. I'll check in with them twice a month, give them tips, whatever it needs, whatever I can. So it's, yeah, I would say mentorship and, um, exposure. Absolutely. And so I want to bring us to a close with a question here. Where is our best base in place to find, follow and support African game developers, creators and in communities? You know what? I think of, of course, going to Steam could be like a traditional thing that we think of. But we see a lot of times and this may speak to it as well. But the idea of, say, a cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation when we see things that may be set in African or in diasporic spaces or, but are not directly created by those hey, people, that culture as, mm-hmm. and, you know, we can easily see a lot of those points of opportunities, not just in gaming, but in popular culture and media as well. So mm-hmm. is there any spaces that maybe come to mind or is this an opportunity as well that we can mm-hmm. find a resource and space to say, these are games that are created in Africa by African developers. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, yeah, so I guess in the interest of collaboration, because um, I was going to say that was an idea I had had personally, which I feel doesn't happen enough. There isn't enough um, consolidated information in Africa about the sector. So it's you can find um, individual, um, you know, pockets of space and developers. You can find a group of developers in Kenya. You can find a group in Nigeria. But they don't, we don't really have platforms where it's like, this is the state of affairs. There isn't one reliable source to get information. So I do think, um, and that's something I've thought of working on in the past is, you know, top 10 games in Africa by um, downloads this week, this month, trending games in Africa and Africa top 10. Um, games per games by genre in Africa. So it's sort of something that sort of puts everything in the same place and then people can find it and people can say, okay, I like African adventure games or I like African sports games. I like, but if it's not all brought together in front of you, people aren't going to do that extra work of, oh, let me see what African games I can find this week or let's see. So yeah, I do think there's, there's definitely space for a platform that sort of, and again, Africa is 54 countries, so it's very challenging. Um, you know, it's not like being in the United States, for instance, where you've got 300 million people, which is, and they've got a lot of money. So if you can sort of just cover that market, you're good. You can't, you can't really do that in get with gaming in Africa. So if you're going to cover a continent that has over a billion people, 54 countries, different languages, you can imagine, um, consolidation is, one of the major challenges. So, um, yeah, I think, um, and maybe that needs to be regional. Maybe it needs to be a West Africa list, an East Africa list. But, but, um, I do think there's a space for platforms that, um, that sort of, and again, it will be challenging and expensive, but there's not enough of that. So if someone can sort of consolidate the information and, um, that, that would be a big help. Yeah. Well, maybe I mean we, we're talking about other things offline and and beyond. Maybe that's a conversation that we'll work towards with Zoom is absolutely uh, you know, place. So now I do want to give you one final opportunity just to just for your thoughts as far as if and this is going to be general, but the idea of, of the future of gaming as mm-hmm. as Africa has its authoritative space in that you know is that on location is that in technology is that in creativity or is that only above um yeah i mean yes all the above right. but um i would say so for me i look at the future of gaming in africa as um so yeah more triple a games that people play titles that everyone you know um someone said the other day if we could i'd like to find a squid games game in Africa, right? You got a, a game from this region that 
is different from everything else everyone is looking at and it's just so good and high quality that the world falls in love with it so i think i look at it as a different platform to show off african creativity um i also see it in a sort of economic way i see it as an opportunity to prove what i already know which is that you know young africans are as intelligent and able to compete across all sectors, if given the right tools and opportunities as everyone else. Um, and I do think the industry is going to be, could be, has the potential to be long term, a big economic driver for a lot of young Africans that I've already met. And um, I can see the enthusiasm. I can see because it's a passion project. That's what a game is, right? It's, it's always going to be a passion project. So that is something that's been extremely energizing for me. Just see how much people are enjoying what they're doing. They tell you about their journey and the challenges. And it's like, they're just, you know, they just keep going. Like they're not going to stop. They want to make this game. So, um, I think it's, it's majorly, it's going to be a platform to show off African creativity to the entire world. And, um, I also look forward to its sort of business impact on the region. And, um, yeah. And also I think we have a few gaps to plug in terms of that. So again, sometimes some connectivity issues, some power issues, as you see, um, and those, those will be plugged over time. We just don't know how much time it will be, but, um, I think, I think the whole world will, will be better for the sort of games that you can get from here. So yeah, that's sort of my, um, and, um, I, I really do hope I can play, you know, a somewhat significant part in, making this a reality. Now, I'm sure you're not only doing that right now, but I, I'm appreciative to have the conversation and, and connections with you at this point, because I do think that people such as yourself are the, our future leadership in, in this space, not just for gaming in Africa, but for gaming in general, as the globalization of this space continues to grow and develop over time. And so we, we do thank you so very much for giving us some fantastic insights and and really a glimpse of, of, of the spaces of the future, which is exactly what we're gonna do here with our creative gene team. We're trying to celebrate in advance and, and give those flowers while we're here to, to those who are making these spaces and places for us to stay included. So with that, Timmy, where can we follow yourself and your work and development uh, as well as keep in touch? Okay, um, so I you can follow both teams to score on Instagram. Um, like I said, it's a soccer page, but we run gaming tournaments every now and then. So if anyone wants to sign up and just follow support, um, I've got a podcast as well, um, by the same name, both teams to BTS podcast. Um, so yeah, please follow me there. And, um, again, I wanted to thank you for reaching out for these conversations. Um, I get a lot of encouragement from speaking to people like yourself who are passionate about, about these things, about, um, Africans and African Americans and, um, so yeah, I'm I'm really honored to speak at a Juneteenth event. Um, shout out to everyone watching this. Um, Y'all have a good weekend, and yeah, call me back anytime. Speak soon. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so very much, Timmy. So again, Timmy Afalabi with both teams to score, as well as Global Expansion Incubator with Microsoft and Xbox. So thank you again, and we will be Thanks in so touch with that. Thank you. Take care. And again, everyone, thank you so very much for joining us and continuing on with the fantastic conversations that are to come here with Creative Juneteenth. And we encourage you to stay tuned and stay included with us here at Simpson. Thank you so very much. Hello and welcome back to Creative Juneteenth 2022. My name is Dejan Sneed and I want to thank you all so very much for being a part of our showcase here today as we celebrate our creative freedoms and the endeavors of us to share our stories with the world. And with that, I want to go ahead and bring forward our next guest, an opportunity I'm very happy to see in its fruition and the opportunity to, to showcase this young talent. And yeah, just us go ahead and bring forward to the stage. Uh, Ms. Breeze B. Sharice Moore, uh, our appreciated author, educator, and editor, and uh, a long time coming. So, uh, yes. but thank you so very much. I appreciate you. And I just want to go ahead and just give the mic right on to you to allow you an opportunity to introduce yourself so we can talk about your fantastic work and the journey to get here. Sure. Um, great seeing you, Dedrin. Um, 
great seeing the beautiful artwork in the background from Satsum and from Sorghum and Spear. Beautiful job that you've done. Um, and yeah, just know that I've been supporting you too. You know, um, it's been hectic. It's been busy for both of us. <laughs> this, these past couple of years have been like a whirlwind, you know. Um, but anyway, let me jump into it. Um, my name is Bisharice Moore. I am an author, an educator, a mom, and an editor. So, and I guess now I'm a publisher. So I have to ask Milton if I can actually say I'm a publisher now. I'm not, I don't quite do what Milton Davis does. You know, I don't have dozens of books uh, that I've published just yet, but um, I'm kind of entering that space. Uh, anyway, so I have been a lover of literature for as long as I can remember. I don't remember a time not loving to write, not loving to read. And um, I followed my heart and I became a spoken word poetry artist in college. And um, I made some amazing connections that I never forgot. I uh, toured the country. And um, I was on the New Jersey Slam team. I'm originally from New Jersey. Right. And um, I'm now located in Baltimore. I live in Baltimore with my husband and my, my five-year-old son. And um, so, yeah, that's how it started out. And it's funny because, like, uh, my first chat book, so this is, I'm dating myself, but this is back in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, we were doing chat books. We were still writing chat books, you know, and... You have a chat book and have 10 or 15 poems in it and you go to the spoken word event and you would sell your chat book. And my first chat book was called Verbal Voodoo. That was my very first chat book. I'm like, I don't know, I think I might've been 19 or 20 years old. And um, so ironically, I've been writing like speculative poetry before it was called speculative poetry. You know, uh, back then I was always experimenting with horror themes and fantasy themes, even in my poetry, you know. Um, and so uh, shortly after graduating from college, I graduated from Rutgers University. I became a teacher. I wanted to become a writer, but I don't know, at those time, that particular time, um, there really wasn't a lot of support, you know, to just write. And even though I have an English degree and a um, with a concentration in creative writing, I don't know, for whatever reason, that really wasn't something that my professors talked about. It's almost as if the professors didn't really believe anyone could do it either, <laughs> which is, I don't know, they just they didn't talk about it. I, I did have one professor, Dr. Jennings, who um, really pushed me. And um, she was the first person to push me to be published traditionally. And she put together this amazing um, anthology of black poetry and everyone in her class, it was a black poetry class, that's what it was called, uh, had uh, poems published in it. And guess who was in the collection? Amiri Baraka and Haki Marabudi. So it was just an amazing experience for me. Yeah. So I'm in the back of my mind, you know, that this can be, I just have to figure some things out, you know? So um, I, I start teaching and I just realized that, oh my gosh, there's like nothing here for my students. <laughs> you know, I'm teaching um, a, a very diverse classroom and, and um, there was almost nothing on the approved list, you know? Um, no black authors. Um, and if, if there were, it was, you know, kind of like the usuals where you would have um, the House of Dyes Dreer, Virginia Hamilton. And then you would also have uh, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, Mildred Taylor. But that was it. You know, that that's the only thing that you have on the approved list. And this is early 2000s. So I just said to myself, uh, what's going on here? Like, why aren't these works approved? You know, and um, we need more books for black authors. So fast forward 20 years later, now it's just like almost a boom of black authors writing YA, writing middle grade, you know, and writing YA, middle grade speculative fiction. And um, I just knew that, I don't know, I wanted to write fantasy. I wanted to write speculative fiction. 
You know, it wasn't, I think I, I really thought I was like unique <laughs> until I'm, I'm online. And I think, I don't even remember how I met Milton and Valjean, but like, I just kind of bumped into them miraculously in 2007, I believe. So we've been cool for like a long time now, you know, and, and it's just like, wait a second, you're writing, a, a, um, you know, a, a fantasy book. I'm writing a fantasy book. Hey, you're doing this. I'm doing this. Wait, there are all these, you know, uh, black people who are writing this, you know, this, this speculative fiction. Like I, I need to know you. And we just literally connected, you know, and, um, I'm so grateful for Milton because what Milton did was he began after Meiji, he began to create anthologies, you know, and give us the opportunities to be in his anthology. So I was like, I was a poet, you know, so writing fiction was really uh, something that came uh, later for me. I always wanted to do it, but I was really intimidated by it. And so eventually I got there and, and then I said, you know what, I think I want to write, you know, uh, speculative fiction for high school students, for middle grade students, you know, and that's how Dr. Marvelous Jen Zott Scholars came about. And uh, then fast forward, Milton publishes it. And, and then I, I had this idea in 2012, so we're going backward again, to create a textbook. And I said, you know, uh, I've never seen this done but I write curriculum for my for my uh, my school. You know, I had been doing it for a few years, and then I'm in graduate school for curriculum writing. You know, so my master's in, is in curriculum writing. I'm like, why can't I do this? You know, it, it just it never occurred to me that I couldn't. The only thing I knew, that, you know, was I needed money, and so um, I I was working at a, with a life coach. Actually, I had like almost had a nervous breakdown, and I quit my job. <laughs> at the very end of 2020. Like I just, I couldn't take it anymore. It was just too much. I just couldn't do it. And so um, I literally kind of went into this cocoon where I just said, you know what, now is the time to make something happen. And like 220 was just this amazing year for me where like I, I got a life coach who, um, and his name is Baron, Baron Davis. And, and Baron is absolutely amazing. And um, he really put me on like this amazing path. And uh, he's also a poet and I'd known him. He's from Jersey. I've known him for over two decades, you know, uh, so I trusted him automatically, you know, and um, he was amazing. And, and so finally I just started to make sure that I was intentional about all I wanted to do. So I saw miraculously that there was this, uh, you know, writing competition and it was specifically for, authors who have children. This is a sustainable arts foundation competition. And so I said, you know what, let me submit. So I submitted, forgot about it, eh, whatever. And at the same time, I was also shopping around, you know, querying Dr. Jen, but I was getting, you know, no, 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 no. So I said, fine, what else could I do? So I look and I see, oh my gosh, fire magazine of uh, black speculative fiction. They're hiring for an acquiring editor. So I just apply, I get that job. And I'm like, yes. So now I'm connected with even more creatives, you know, creatives that they I admire, you know, I had already had been published in FIA, I think what, a, a year or two prior, you know? So I was familiar with it, I had a subscription. So I said, you know what, I think I'm a good fit for that, you know? And so I, I got that position. Then in like May of 2020, I get this email, oh my gosh, I won the fiction competition. It was $5,000, you know? And I was like, this is amazing. And you know, there were like 1800 applicants, incredible. So that made me feel amazing. So then I say to my life coach, I say to Baron, I say, hey Baron, um, what, what can I do? Like, I, I really wanna um, do an Indiegogo campaign for this, for this textbook. And he's like, so do it. What's stopping you? And I'm just like, what if people think I'm silly? I don't know. I'm not quite sure. And he's just like, do it. So I'm like, okay. And I do it. And then um, a sister, again, now I'm connected to Fire, which um, 
connects me to the NSS Slack channel, where now I'm connected to even more Black creatives who specifically write science fiction and fantasy and horror and their subgenres. And um, the sister's like, hey, I love that idea. Let me just boost your campaign. And so she's on the West Coast. She boosts my campaign and all of a sudden it explodes and it's, it's funded within a month. And so I'm like, oh my goodness. And then, you know, for Indiegogo campaign, you have to, uh, you have to have perks. So I'm like, okay, what do I, what do I have laying around here that gives the folks a perk? So I had this short story, this random short story that I liked a lot, but I never like thought to, to sell it or try to sell it. So I just had, you know, left that as a perk. And one thing I did with my campaign was every single person who contributed, even if it was a dollar, I sent them a personalized email to thank them because I just, I'm really serious about that. Like if you give me your money, like you really believe in me, you know, people's hard earned money. That means a lot. And I wanted to be true to that. So I was just, you know, randomly sending out emails. And if finally I get this email from someone who randomly contributed to the campaign and it's an agent. And she's like, I absolutely love that story. Let's talk about representation. Do you have representation? I'd like to represent you. And I look up and it's Laurie McLean and she is the partner agent at Fuse. So we corresponded for a few weeks, talked over Zoom and boom. Now, like <laughs> I have a contract with her, you know, and, and I represented by an agent. And then two years later, I have three book deals, you know, and now we're here and we have Conjuring Worlds, text, the textbook and that was really, really, really long, Dedrin, <laughs> with me just talking. So I'm finished now. And I, I yeah, because I mentioned Dr. Marvelous Jen. Yeah. And so I have a, a two book deal with Harper Collins, and I have a uh, one book deal with Algonquin Books for Young Readers. So, yeah. Uh -huh. So all, all of them amazing prelude to the, the fantastic work to continue. So from yeah. the earlier part of, was it, uh, let's see, was it visual? Was it, it was the Venom. Which one was that? Was it visual or virtual? What, what was the wording for your original uh, link of uh, a spoken word? Oh, verbal voodoo. Ver verbal voodoo. There you go. So yes. from verbal voodoo, <laughs> the conjuring yes. world. Right? The idea right. is... Right. That, you know, you, you've had a fantastic, well-deserved run. So a, a few things on that. And obviously, we want to shout out uh, also Milton Davis of MV Media, who likewise provided a fantastic platform for myself and my works there. I, I mean, there's so many parts that we can go to, but I really want to talk about that journey from there to now. In Conjuring Worlds, where where do you see like the real turning point for that? to to really be the a, a hallmark part of your uh your writing career so far um honestly i look for where there's a need you know um of course it's about my passion and what i'm passionate about that matters but um this past year i worked for a homeschooling collective you know and uh years prior to that I heard whisperings about homeschools and homeschooling collectives and homeschoolers. And then I had a couple of friends who homeschooled their children. And I was just curious about it because being a public school teacher, I, I knew that there were a lot of problems with public schools, you know, and um, having a young child, I had a lot of conversations with my husband about whether or not we would be sending him there, you know? So, um, I started to just really do research and say, okay, so what do they need? And then I started to ask them what they need. And literally it was like, you know, <laughs> it would be probably nice to have like, you know, some, a textbook or something like that because they do so much piecemealing together, you know? Um, and they wanted something that I don't know, wasn't as, as a, uh, stringent, I guess you could say, and rigid as public school textbooks are. Because when you look at a public school textbook, they're so traditional textbook. I shouldn't say they're not called public school textbooks, but traditional <laughs> textbooks are just 
so rigid and there's so much going on. Sometimes I would even look at my students and my students would be like, where am I supposed to be looking? Like <laughs> there's this box and this box and this box and this standard and this standard and this, you know, and, and I didn't want the textbook to look like that. And I just had my, an idea of, of what I wanted it to be. If, if I were able to get the money, get the cash I needed to make sure everybody was paid, you know, and cause that's of course, extremely important. And how would this be organized? What would be in it? Who would I like to see in it? Most of all, you know, this is my baby. And so, uh, that's how I came to this conclusion, you know, that I would do a project like this because there's a void, especially for secondary, you know, um, for the, the younger grades, homeschoolers are, it's a little bit easier. There are a lot more materials available for children that are ages six, you know, five, seven, eight, you know, they're not really getting into anything, um, quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. There's, it's just not that complicated, not yet. But then when you get into middle school, late middle school, high school, those materials, you know, those parents need that. And it's often not there. Or if it is there, um, some of it is, is Christian. You know, it's a lot of homeschoolers are Christian. So when you look around, there's homeschooling materials, but a lot of it is Christian based, you know, um, and that's not what a lot of, uh, black homeschoolers want. And, uh, according to, you know, the statistics, our communities are beginning to homeschool our, our children faster than any other group in the country, especially since the pandemic. Now, well said. Now, the idea of being able to bring this type of material, when we're talking about conjuring worlds, that we're speaking intentionally about Afrofuturism, how was right. it trying to introduce this to the larger audience of, of say, homeschooling? versus one that may be a little bit more initiated, say the audience of Fire Magazine or maybe in the space of speculative fiction. Was that a concern? Was that part of your intent to introduce? Or what was the thought process in making and bringing all this fantastic work together? Um, it, was, it wasn't difficult at all. You know, um, most of the people were just kind of surprised, first of all, that I was doing it or even had the idea to do it. And I think they were surprised that like it actually got done because <laughs> it just, you know, the, the hardcover just dropped what, like a couple of days ago. So, you know, it's, it's, it's still pretty new, but, um, um, I just, yeah, I think that people, they were, they were very, of course, you know, um, they were willing to, you know, submit work. Like when I contacted Tanana Reeve, she was like, absolutely. I have something course, you know, when I contacted uh, P. Jelly Clark, you know, of course, um, I did not know Cherie Renee Thomas that well, but once I explained to her what I wanted to do, she was, you know, she was all in, same with Linda, and of course, I have a relationship with Milton because he's my publisher and we've been friends for a long time. So, um, and Troy, technically, he's my boss at FIRE, <laughs> so, you know, Troy was, he was on board too. So, um, I think everybody was excited about it, you know, um, and it, there, it wasn't difficult. They were just like, wow, this needs to happen. And I'm glad you're doing it. So it's tons of support, tons of support. Yes. Now to take a step back also to the, you know, your first publishing part with Milton Davis and that, and, and your release from there. Cause we do want to take a step back to show that obviously this is a, a long-term journey. Uh, of the Marvelous Gin. Uh, how was that in contrast to creating this uh, current textbook and any, any ideas or ideals that maybe you learned along the way there that perhaps helped on that? Oh, well, Dr. Marvelous Gin is different because um, all I'm doing really is turning in a manuscript to Milton and then he takes it from there, you know, but one thing that was great is I did have some input in my, um, my cover art, which was great. I had complete, you know, uh, input in that. Um, I even had access to the, um, to the artist, um, uh, Marcella Shane Jackson, who did a fantastic job on the artwork. Oh, I actually have it right here. Let me get it out. Dr. Jen. So this is Dr. Marvelous Jen yes. Odd Scholars. Yes. So, um, so, 
that was great. Um, but that that really did it. Um, I don't want to say help me in any way, except that it, it connected me to Milton, you know. Um, and then I I just said to Milton, hey, I'd like to include excerpts of both of our novels in Conjuring Worlds. And he was like, oh, of course, you can have it. You know, you're good, you're good, you know? And so um, it includes, you know, an excerpt, the first chapter from Dr. Marvelous Chin, and it also includes um, an excerpt from um, Amber and the Enchanted Sword, which is one of Milton's novels, so his his uh, middle grade novel. So I I say that yeah it, that that worked out really well. But as far as you know, it teaching me how to put this together, that that really wasn't connected. I'd already made those those connections over the years, you know, uh, which just shows you how valuable connections are, you know. So yeah. I know that that's good to know. And and now as far as connecting things forward, looking at the journey of where it took to get to now and, and where you see the space, particularly for being a published author and now having more of the book deals than the, than I would say the road ahead to be a little bit more defined. How do you approach the keeping the same creative energy and, and being able to have that type of input in your own work and keeping that authenticity to the stories that you want to tell? I'm grateful for my agent. Um, at Fuse Literary, they really encourage and support hybrid authors. You know, a hybrid author is an author that self publish when they want, and they also traditionally publish, you know, when they want. So I'm um, clearly both. I'll do both. You know, um, I'll sign with, you know, a HarperCollins, of course, but there's also some things that I, I want to keep to myself. Like the text, this is my baby. You know, I want it you know, to, to self-publish this. And um, I'm happy that I did. So um, the way ahead is, is just to continue to produce. You know, I have so many ideas. Um, right now I'm taking my research for Dr. Jen, um, which is the story of four teenagers who win a contest in 1920 to tour a colored amusement park. You know, so um, it's an amazing story. I, I love this, but a lot of the history that I uncovered from Dr. Jen, I'm able to now uh, use for nonfiction books. You know, a lot of it was really obscure history uh, about black magicians, about colored amusement parks. And this is history that uh, I think that the general public needs to know, you know, um, and not just in, you know, a, an adult book, but in, in books that are kid friendly you know, in picture books. So um, that's the road ahead, just to continue to produce, but to uh, continue to produce things that I hope teachers and parents can use and students will enjoy. Because I know when I was a child, um, I was often bored. <laughs> and um, I think that as I become an adult, I am uncovering all this amazing, obscure history, you know, black history in this country and also, you know, throughout the world. And I'm like, why in the world are we spending all this time learning about, I don't know, the steel industry? <laughs> I remember that being so boring. Now, of course, we should know about steel and we should know about Rockefeller. Yeah, okay. But there's still some other things that were going on at that time that I felt like were so rich, you know? that I would have loved to learn about. And um, that's where Conjuring Worlds comes in. You know, um, it's not just a textbook that covers uh, fiction. Um, there are also nonfiction essays that support the fiction. So for instance, and the poetry, there, uh, Tanana Reefdu has a, um, she has a story in here called Thursday Night Shift. And Thursday Night Shift, it takes place in 1968 and Thursday night shift um, surrounds the, uh, the events around um, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. But right after Thursday night shift, there is a, an amazing essay called To Memphis With Love and it's all about the Lorraine Motel and the history of the Lorraine Motel. 
So um, again, there's fiction, but there's also some amazing nonfiction um, that supports the speculative, you know, poetry and the speculative fiction that's in the book. I also have some amazing interviews with authors and television writers and, you know, so this is uh, Troy Wiggins, publisher of Afaya. So I have a, an interview with him. Um, of course, this is Cherise, Nine Bar Blues, you know, and so yeah, it's, it's a lot. There's a glossary in here. There are rubrics for parents and teachers to use to score their their uh, children's and students' work, you know, once they finish the the activities. And these are some of the, the activities um, that I have included after each poem and an article. So um, I'm really excited about it. And I just hope that it can be of use, you know, in the classroom and with homeschoolers. You know, I can just tell not only with your own work, but the the pantheon of talent that you have on those pages, the, the evaluation in the classroom and beyond is, is just now getting started. Now, a couple of quick questions before we close. Is that book now sure. available? It is. It is now available. It's available on Amazon. It's available on Barnes and Noble. Pretty much everywhere. You know, it's available wherever books are sold. So you can order it online. I know someone told me that it was sold out. So that's interesting. I don't know where they were uh, looking because I, I didn't see that it was sold out, but it's possible. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's available now. Um, 472 pages, over a hundred extension activities, um, 20 short stories, eight poems, nine essays, I believe, uh, over a dozen, nearly two dozen rubrics, a glossary of 385 words, and the activities are tiered for different learners. So it's a massive, massive book, and I'm so, so proud of it. So proud of it. Oh, and a massive success. And and in the sum, what what next? What now is our kind of our final um, points of thoughts and reflections? Now, now you're able to hold that your baby in your arms, per se, right? And, and right. now you have these other things. What are some of the other things that are on the horizon for you as far as not only just for the things that you want to write, but just for yourself as a creator? So how can we connect and understand and appreciate what's the next steps of your journey maybe? Honestly, next, I would really like to develop a video game for Dr. Jen. That's something that I'd really like to do. Um, and my network, one of my former students is a uh, television writer. She's out in Hollywood. Last year, we actually pitched Dr. Jen to a major studio. It was amazing. And the fact that they like were interested was incredible. But, you know, as time went on, we couldn't find a producer. So things fell through. But I'd really like to try again to pitch something else with her. So, um, Video games, um, television shows, possibly, and then just making sure that as many homeschoolers and schools that want this get it, you know. So um, I know there's a friend of mine. She's another educator, and she has a story in here. Uh, Janelle Naomi, we were talking yesterday, and uh, there is an idea to create like a, a an interactive website to go with the textbook. So um, that would be great. And I'm trying to think of some other things. I think that's it. Yeah. So video games and and more writing, of course, you know, because I, I know I have a revise and resubmit coming for another picture book that I just wrote. So I'm crossing my fingers that I can get another deal. And, and um, yeah, Fatima's Fantastic City will be out in 2025. Uh, with Harper Collins and Bangs, Feathers, and Folklore, Africa's uh, Amazing Beats. That's my um, compendium. It's a middle grade compendium of African mythological creatures that'll be out next year in 2023 from Algonquin Young Readers. So I've got a lot happening and um, it's nowhere to go but up. 
Oh, no, it's it's such a, a pleasure, not only as a, a creator, but just as a fan to, to see and, and support these fantastic endeavors. So, you know, it, it's all great. And, and again, you know, definitely up and up and onward from here. So you know, congratulations Absolutely. in advance. But where can we follow you and your work? We want to give a moment to make sure that we keep connected and showcase and share um, how we can also be a part of your creative journey. So on Twitter, I'm at um, Sharice underscore B. Um, on Facebook, I'm at B Sharice dot more. So it's B dot Sharice dot more. Um, that's Facebook. Uh, on Instagram, where am I on Instagram? I wish I had done all the same name. You know, back in the day, I didn't do that for whatever reason. It's so weird. All right. So on Instagram, (laughs) it's B.Sharice. And um, I'm also on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel where I review uh, books for uh, teachers. And I also talk about, you know, different activities. And that is called More Books with B.Sharice. And that's my YouTube channel. So yeah, you can find me anywhere, any of those places. Oh, all great. And and we'll definitely make sure to amplify this space as well as your own successes and in, in some conversations to come. But I appreciate you taking you know, part of the time to be a part of our Creative Juneteenth. Uh, you're definitely an exemplary example you know, of sharing and, and being a part of your the creative journey as well as you know the stories within you that tell our history as well as pave a, a bright future. So I thank you very much for your example as well as uh, as being a part of our show here today. Thank you so much, Dedrin. All and right, no. Take care. No, absolutely. Thank you so very much. And with that, everyone, that was B. Sharice Moore, our author, educator, and editor extraordinaire and bringing not only the conjuring worlds but a fantastic litany of creative and creative stories to share and showcase so with that we want to take a slight break in our show but if you'll please stay tuned we'll have more of creative june 2022 so stay tuned and stay included with us at subsume thank you so much greetings everyone um my name is dean peters i'm a doctoral student at teachers college in social studies education my background is in African studies and political science, and I'm joined here with the amazing Dr. Um, Sherry Cummings. Um, and Sherry, would you mind introducing yourself? Thank you, Dane. Um, I am Dr. Sherry Cummings. My background is also in Africana studies. I received my PhD at um, Brown University, and my area of research is the Atlantic world or the Black Atlantic, like we um like to call it, early African-American history, as well as Africana intellectual history. Oh, wow. That is, that is a lot, you know, mm-hmm. I'm hoping to, hoping to reach there at some point in time. Mm-hmm. Well, so this, af- so this afternoon, um, we are here to discuss, as you know, Juneteenth is, is upon us pretty soon. And um, we wanted to have this conversation about Juneteenth. And in, in a larger context, what does Juneteenth mean, um, not just for African-Americans and Americans, but well, how does that translate on a global scale? As you know, America is very much a global hegemony and everything gets exported on a cultural front to the rest of the world. And so what, is, what does Juneteenth mean? in the rest of the world. And so um, I'm happy to be joined with, to be joined here with you, um, um, Sherry, um, as your background is in, in that time period and how did and the, the reverberations of, of emancipation, um, and what does that mean? For that? So um, I think the first question um, I would like to ask you, um, is what does what does Juneteenth mean for the United States? Mm-hmm. Well, that's kind of a loaded question. 
mainly because we here in the United States, um, we tend to reduce our holidays to, to commerciality or materiality. And it kind of loses its meaning. Mm. And we, so when we look at Juneteenth celebrations today, everyone is like, okay, freedom, freedom, freedom. But then there's also a commerciality to it where um, everyone's promoting Juneteenth sales. We had the big fiasco with Walmart and their Juneteenth themed mm. ice cream, you know, right. things like that. And so it kind of loses its, the heart of its meaning. And um, therefore we can't really grasp what, Juneteenth is, what it means for us, especially today as we um, encounter um, things that issues in, within the African-American community mm. and, and those issues that reach a global scale. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I think what we need to do is take a step back and revisit the role of Africans and their descendants in this country right. and how they were influenced globally by things that were happening around the world because the, the misconception is that history happens in a vacuum. Right. And it doesn't. No, it absolutely does not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to stay, I want to stay there for a little bit because I'm, I'm also thinking about, um, Brother, Brother Teo's book, Elite Capture. I'm not sure if you've heard of that book recently, um, but it's, his work has been making the circuit recently. And so what he's talking about in, in such as like this elite capture is that both those, um, those who are considered white liberals and those who are considered even black, um, white, white conservatives, as well as, you know, black elite, uh, engage in this elite capture way in which there's a co-opting and appropriating of the grassroots movements right. um, that has a commercial interest. So, for example, I'm thinking of, I'm looking at Juneteenth and its celebration. And recently, um, Citibank um, had a commercial that was kind of kind of intimating that they were promoting. Um, and to point, you know, their black customers mm -hmm. um, and having opportunities for opportunities for African Americans. When in fact, you know, when you juxtapose that, you know, Citibank was extremely complicit in 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 their role in slavery and complicit in, in, the, in the theft of 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 um, our Haitian brothers and sisters gold. Uh, so I thought that was I thought that was um, more than just irony or hypocrisy um but i i i found it to be quite um in a historical context kind of repulsive to the point where you might have to laugh at it to the to that sense so yeah um i i do i i would like to i would like to um say a shout out to city bank on that one <laughs> in a, in a, in a way uh, right I also think about um, and Dylan Hines, Dylan Hine Clark's work on on the anthologies on 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 on, on living man, where she pointed out um, the way in which people had issues with how black folks celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, we should be doing it this way and doing it that way, or we should be organizing, and that is true. We should be organizing as as. Um, the late Kwame Torre um, said we should be organizing and mobilizing, but there should also be a point of mo of memory and ritual and, and creating of rituals. And so I, I look at the the race riots of of Memphis, and one of the things that they had issues with was the fact that they were um, celebrating, and mm -hmm. they would have parades, and they would yes, they would fire shots in the air, and you know like you know folks who may have who be watching a lot of like you know dance all or whatever it is to make a dance or you see the bus are shot in the air that kind of thing right um and people and and the, the presence of black soldiers um also irritated um their white counterparts because you're looking at the person who defeated you right so you're looking at people who destroyed um the social structure in which you found value in being superior exactly and, and so 
I, I, I look at those, I look at those moments. And so I look at this idea of emancipation and mm-hmm. the way in which African Americans had to play, had to play um, an active role in their emancipation. And oftentimes I think that gets lost, that it was, it was, it was a charity of white folks that um, that granted emancipation, when fact black folks were at the forefront of their uh, of their emancipation, their manumission. Absolutely, and I think this is when I say, um, or this is why I say, history does not happen in a vacuum. So mm-hmm. I want to go back to um, the 1750s oh. when the, with the Seven Years' War, and the reason why I go back is so you can see that timeline, because right. freedom is one thing. Yeah, we can, you know, we can be free in a sense, but it's not just about freedom. It's mm. about being recognized as full citizens citizens in this here United States. Right. So you have Africans and African Americans fighting in the Seven Years of War. Why? Because they are told not only that they can be free, but they can gain land. Land was of the utmost importance in the colonial era. Because that meant as a free man, you were paying taxes, you had representation in the government, right? And so you have African-Americans fighting in the Seven Years' War, fighting in the American Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know that in the American Revolution, you had Africans and African-Americans fighting on the side of patriots, as well as fighting on the side of the British. You have Lord Dunmore's um, proclamation in the South, Telling right. people, hey, if you fight on the side of the British, you have your freedom. And because of that, like 25,000 African Americans alone in like the state of South Carolina or, or Virginia fled to the side of the British because yeah. they wanted their freedom, right? But not just freedom, they also wanted to be recognized as full citizens yes. under the law. The United States was not prepared to do that. And we see that when the American Revolution is over, they're like, okay, we can give you land. You can pay taxes, right? And this is, our, this is the irony of it, but you don't have full representation, right? <laughs> and what was the revolution fought for? Well, no taxation without mean, representation. representation. Right. But so they were not willing to give Africans and African-Americans that, that next step to being realized as full citizens. So what happens? We go and we fight in what? The War of 1812. The same thing. We're promised land. We're promised our freedoms, but we're not promised full citizenship. And we can see um, as um, the Northern states are granting North, um, um, gradual abolition. We can see what um, the black community is fighting for in Philadelphia. They mm-hmm. want citizenship. Okay, so in the 1800s, I'm going to pause for a second, because what do we celebrate? They celebrated what? Haiti. Right. Right. That was it. They were like, well, look, if they can do it on this tiny little island in the Caribbean Sea, our freedoms can be realized. Emancipation can be realized. Full citizenship can be realized. And so for us, our celebration was. January 1st or January 4th, because we knew that if they can achieve freedom and full citizenship in Haiti, it was possible for us. And it had a rippling effect in the United States because black communities were like, okay, we're looking to Haiti to see what we can do. Wait, hold on. So doc, Mm -hmm. I heard in my, looking through my history, looking through my, um, some of my history texts, wasn't folks in Philadelphia, black folks in Philadelphia, lining up to, to find their way to Haiti at, at one point in time? Absolutely, in the 1820s. In the ah. 1820s, that's when um, what you call immigration to Haiti started to pick up again. Because you have the president, um, after the death of Henry Christophe, you have um, Boyer coming, um, bringing the North and the South together. And he's like, okay, let's revisit these um, immigration plans because not only do we need people, we need a workforce, right? And one of the ways to um, promise a viable workforce was to not only grant land, but to grant citizenship. Now, I know that, so 1804, Haiti 
has its declared its independence. 1805, they, in their constitution, they say any person coming to Haiti is given is considered a Haitian citizen. citizen. Mm-hmm. Regardless, and, um, and regardless of ethnicity. So you have Polish soldiers who fought right. in Haiti and they're like, yo, I'm staying over here because I'm a full citizen. What am I going to go back to? Okay. Wow. You have French, even though um, Jean-Jacques Dessalines did his best to get rid of all the whites in Haiti, some went back because what they realized that they can be full citizens under the Haitian constitution. Right. Wow. And so this is why freedom is not the only thing that is important. You can be granted your freedom, yes, but it means so much more when you're granted full citizenship because you are seen as a man because, you know, men and yeah. could, were the, most of the times were the only ones that could hold land, right? right? And have an effect on the government structure before the law. So you have people running to Haiti. After Haiti, what happens? We're fighting, we're fighting. The War of 1812 is going on. We're not granted full citizenship. We're fighting, we're saying, look, I am worthy of being a full citizen. We're proving time and time again that we are capable of being full citizens. It doesn't get granted to us, right? Then you have Britain abolishing slavery in all its territories. 1838. Absolutely. What do we celebrate in the United States? August Monday, the first, yes, Emancipation Day. So when um, Frederick Douglass comes out with his famous speech, what is the 4th of July to the slave? It doesn't mean anything to us because we're not granted our freedoms and we're not granted citizenship, but we are looking globally at what black communities are doing. Haiti, and then in the British, in the British, former British colonies. Those are our celebrations. Because I'm seeing, I'm I'm also seeing that by 1824, mm-hmm. slavery is kind of abolished in Central America, mm-hmm. um, and then by 1829, mm-hmm. uh, it's abolished in Mexico. So, and, and the interesting thing about that is Simon Bolivar was a slaveholder. Wow. And in order for him to receive aid from Haiti, he was told that he had to abolish slavery. That was a condition. Right, right. Uh, Yeah, he was given the printing press, Mm -hmm. lots of guns and ammunition and stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. You can bring it back. I mean, even though I know we're, you know, we're, you know, we're dabbling a little bit with Haiti and everything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important to understand, like, like. These things have reverberations. Like whenever there was, you know, con- you know, talks of revolt and emancipation mm-hmm. um, that's happening in the in in the in the Black Atlantic, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, amongst amongst the slave holding class, they had they ex- they went to a considerable um, amount of effort to keep that silence so that it would not inspire black folks to want the same thing. So like. So I'm, I'm 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 thinking that at the at that at that end they were very organized in mm-hmm. ensuring that this system of free enforced free labor that was dehumanizing and that counts mm-hmm. was a, was that let's keep this going and let's work together to, to so so would it be would it would it be you know. Would it be the same way in which, on the same side of it, that Africans uh, at that time and descendants of slavery would also want to work in in that kind of unison um, to abolish themselves or to spread the word of what we are doing? Absolutely. This is why it's so important to look at what is going on in relation to what is going on globally. Wow. So you have people like Paul Cuffey, who was driving that emigration to Sierra Leone. You wow. have people like, um, oh my gosh, um, Absalom Jones and Richard, especially Richard Allen, because he envisioned right. a utopia, if you will, in um, um, Haiti. And so that drive was... Richard Allen, who started the AME Church? 
Absolutely, in Philadelphia. So it was not just about freedom. It was about the realization of being considered full citizens in, 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 in the eyes of the law. Wow. You know, like I said, anybody could be granted their freedom. But if you're not seen as a full citizen, then what are you? Hmm. That's a that's a really good question, because I think we're asking these questions. And, and yes, and they and absolutely. And so this um, is why it leads to questions about today, because right. um, we're still fighting for voting rights. Right. We're That's still true. fighting against some it's like places like in Brazil or South Africa, state sanctioned violence because yeah. we're, you know, we're not seen as full citizens. Yeah. And this is a problem yeah. for black and brown people across the globe. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so when we talk about Juneteenth, we can't just talk about the fact that African, African-Americans in Texas, especially, were free. Yeah. Yes, they did get the notice late. They did. Um, that's understandable. Yeah. But we also forget that people who um, who were enslaved in those border states, like Delaware, like Missouri, I believe um, Maryland, yes, uh, Kansas, they were not freed until December, yeah, eighteen sixty-five. So we have to understand that too, you know. Yeah. That yes, Juneteenth is important because they got the message late. Hey. But what about all these other people who are living in a state of unfreedom as well? Yeah, because I'm thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about this timeline, and and, and see like now that everyone is so hyper, you know, so in tune into the, the legislative process, you know, mm-hmm. they, you know, the presidential executive order, which is the Emancipation Proclamation, is signed in 18, in, in 1863 and then mm-hmm. by 1865 almost a full two years before it has to go through the, the house and then go through the senate before mm-hmm. it, it arrives at 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 the president's um off and then he signs it so right. you know and so the, here's an opportunity in which you know at least for high school teachers to really delve into this and say that if this was not a unanimous thing that we should grant black folks freedom or anything like that in, in, in letter of law, you know, like mm-hmm. if we, need, like, you know, like, you know, we need our permission for, for freedom, like, you know, like, right. um, but they actually had reservations about this. Like, absolutely, it, absolutely. And this is where, especially in education, being a professor and teaching, I always stress critical thinking. I do not like it when um, we, as um, educators, we tell our students something and then they take it as face value and do not question. Right. You know, they have to question these things. And so, like you said, okay, if the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1863, why did it take two years for it to take effect? Right. Well, Lincoln, a lot of scholars look at Lincoln, they're taking very critical looks at Lincoln. They understand that freeing Africans and African-Americans or descendants of those Africans who labored in this country was not his utmost priority. In fact, he was was looking for land in South America where all free... Right. Guatemala or Nicaragua, one of those countries. Right. 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 For us to to be shipped to, if you will. Right. right? Because he didn't want us, you know, free black people influencing those who were enslaved. Right. His main goal was to bring the North and the South back together. Absolutely. That was it. You know. And so we have to really think critically about that. What does that mean for us? Mm. You know, so people are running, running around. Yeah, Lincoln freed the slaves. Well, you know, let's think about that for a second. You know, what did that entail? Yeah, How I'm, did that really affect us? And because you know, if he really was interested in f- f- quote unquote freeing us, he would have also made us citizens. Yeah. For the law. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would, and I would add this before we move on to the next, to the next, to the next set of questions. Mm-hmm. Is that. You know, from 1843, when you were having the color conventions, mm-hmm. black folks knew war was coming. Absolutely. And like Henry Harding Garnett was like, yo, we need to, you know, we need to squad up. We need to get ourselves some guns. And no, at the time, Frederick Douglass was like, you crazy. 
So, <laughs> Harry Jones, rest in peace, amazing storyteller in terms of African American military military history. Mm-hmm. He writes his story in a TED talk, and he you know he speaks about how you know a few years after. Garland tells makes that speech in, in, in Buffalo about we need to we need to be prepared and everything like that. Mm-hmm. He goes he goes on the abolitionist talk in um in, in Philadelphia and runs into some trouble and he almost gets you know he is you know he's about to be you know he's some terrible things yeah. about after him and his colleagues and who shows up Henry Harding Garnet with his squad and so <laughs> Douglas comes to the next color convention like we need guns we need a lot right. of guns we need to squad up we need to get ready and so we had. Black folks training in the South, mm-hmm. black folks training in Vancouver, and training in the North, and even Martin Delaney. And by the time they were ready to be incorporated into the into the action into the military, the uh, the mm-hmm. army, mm-hmm. they were they were far more they were far more trained than than some of the regular than some of the soldiers that were coming. In, contrary to that movie Glory, where you know Denzel. Right. Having the tie in his tie, right? And right, right. And I'll be trained. Look, the black came version. Trained. They came in far more trained, and and some of them were sergeants. Delaney's, right. um, Delaney and and Frederick Douglass's um son actually took on high, took on um, rank positions where they where they where they were drill sergeants. So Absolutely, that, that's a you know that part of it. You know, it, it grinds my so when I go through this with my students in my college classrooms, they're like, "This happened." Yes. I mean, we could even go back to um, Delaney's um, predecessor, David Walker, how militant he was. You know, I mean, of course, he wrote his appeal after the death of Thomas Jefferson, but he was on fire. He was like, look, this is what we need to do, you know, and and, you know, (laughs) as militant as as he can get and the way in which he delivered his appeal. You know, because we, you know, we had to be very um, innovative, if you will, right. sewing, up, sewing up the appeal in, in the in the linings of coats and stuff right. tailored so that everybody could understand what he was trying to do. Yeah. So it's not something like I said, it's not something and, and not for nothing. These sailors are going across the seas. They're yeah. going back to Haiti. They're going in the Caribbean. They're like, yeah. look, this is what's going on. Awesome. You need to fight because we're fighting. You know, absolutely, and that's mm-hmm. a great point. Before we move on, Martin Delaney was sailing to to Nigeria right before, before the Civil War. And he had, the treaty was done, was set and ready for mm-hmm. black folks, free black folks, to leave and to come to Nigeria. And then when war broke out, he said, "You know what? Let's put this in hold. This is an opportunity." Right. And right. when they saw that Reconstruction was failing, they were like, "Okay, let's dust this back to Africa thing." Over. Right. And right. that maybe we need to revisit it to leverage to for leverage for full right. you know, so. And so this is why I say um, we need to think critically, because right. what did Reconstruction attempt? Well, what was the plan of Reconstruction to disenfranchise Black people? Because right. now that we were free and we were like, okay, we are full citizens. You know, that Fourteenth Amendment was like, look, we have the right to vote. You know, you can't make any laws that yeah, deny us 40, these things yeah, from the 13th to the 15th Amendments. And so what did white Democrats do? They were like, mm-mm, mm-mm, nah, you're not going to take this country. And so what happens? Jim Crow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. Absolutely. And you make a good point about land and because I think about South Carolina mm-hmm. and by the time of Reconstruction, 74% of the South Carolina legislation was, was, was Black men, right? Absolutely. And Absolutely. one of the things that they passed was the Land Commission Act, which, right. which allowed Black folks to purchase large plots of land, which is being, which is being snapped, snatched from under them as we speak today. Right? Absolutely. That's how their inheritances are uh, structured. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, the land taken away from business developers, right? Right, and, and, heirs ownership, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the other question that you know, and this is going great. I really hope <laughs> that you know we time doesn't run out on us. Um, but I think we ask we ask a question. We ask the first question about what does it mean to the United States and what does it mean to the sense of, of of American slavery. But then the last question is, what does it mean for what is what does Juneteenth mean for descendants within the African diaspora? And right. the reason why I'm asking that question is because I, I'm. In, in, in the timeline in my head, 
right? United States is the fourth, is it is it is is the um the third from the third to last country in the black world that abolishes slavery. Mm-hmm. 1865, the 13th Amendment passed, mm-hmm. right? And 18, 1873, slavery mm-hmm. ends in Puerto Rico. In 1886, it ends in Cuba. Cuba. And 1888 yeah. is in Brazil. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so, they, so those are three countries that are ahead, that, that are, are after the United States of America, right? Mm-hmm. Before mm-hmm. that, we're having, I, I listed Mexico, I listed um, the, the Dutch, the Dutch and the French colonies was in, mm-hmm. 18, was in 1848. Yes. Right? No, wait. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, 1848, that's, that's correct, right. Right? right? And so you have all these countries that are doing so well before the United States. So where they are, where the United States of America is at, at, this, at that juncture is that they're late, they're late and they're late in terms of if you want to use the word modernization. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, if you could jump off of, of, of that. Well, the interesting thing is, like you said, we have the United States in 1865, then you have Puerto Rico, then you have Cuba, and then you have Brazil. Right. The United States had their hands in all three of those countries. Because the main thing is resources. Wow. Right? When you think about it, what the U.S. economy was very contingent upon was cotton at the time. Who who was going, where are they going to get these resources in order to produce the products that they need to produce in order to be leading um, importers, exporters, et cetera, in the world? Puerto Rico, Cuba, Brazil. Hmm. You know, that's, again, think critically about the history. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It does not. Right. You know, like um, I remember telling my students at um, with the Louisiana Purchase, everybody um, likes to, most scholars like to frame it as, oh, Napoleon needed money to fund his part of the revolution against Haiti was right. the man at the time. But I was like, yeah, but there's something underlying going on here. Right. Because that purchase was funded by British financiers. Oh, really? Yes. No, Why? We have a few more minutes. Do tell me. <laughs> it was funded by British financiers because the Industrial Revolution was kicking off in Britain at the time, and they needed cotton. And the cotton, mm-hmm. America was the top producer of cotton. So what does the Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase do to the United States? It allows them to be the number one cotton producer. It opens up the South, the Deep right. South, to cotton production. Right. And you have London financiers financing that cotton production. And par- portions of that resource is going back to Britain to fuel their in, um, industrial revolution. So let me get this straight. The same <laughs> England. Yeah, man. The same England, doing mm-hmm. my calculations here, that mm-hmm. had a war with the U.S. Mm-hmm. Not the U.S., but the colonies, 13 colonies, and then mm-hmm. tried to come back again. You mean to tell me 30 years after they, they, they decide, you know what, man, let's brother fight and brother, let's come together. We make never, money, we the never, the United folks. States d- never completely severs their ties with, with England. They don't. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. There's too many cousins. Too many cousins. I mean, part of my work here is, although I'm like between the um, 16th and 18th centuries, is looking at those familial networks. You have New England families who have networks not only in New England, but in the Caribbean. So someone's brother can have a plantation in the Caribbean who also has shipping rights in Bristol. And so it's like, so... You got to look at those connections. They don't die once no, the don't. American Revolution happens. Funny as you say that, I had a conversation with some relatives because I did some digging because, because of my Caribbean background. Um, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother was an amazing 
oral historian. She mm -hmm. took it. Took she took the she took the family tree orally before she died, mm -hmm. all the way back to the eighteen seventies, eighteen seventies, and she started with her great 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 grand her great 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 grandmother. And then when I when I looked at who the plantation owner is, it was a Scottish woman, which as you shared with me some, a, a, two years ago, that it was not uncommon to have female slaveholders. And that's for another conversation. Absolutely. And when I looked at her, bro her, her half-brother, mm -hmm. he had a plantation in Antigua. Mm -hmm. And he had, he had investments in South Carolina. So it's not, it's not uncommon that he would, he would move an enslaved African from say the island of Taraku to Antigua, from Antigua to South Carolina, almost as if he owned a sports franchise. But exactly. you know, let's not get into those. Yeah, things. that's another whole other. That's conversation. another whole thing, right? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> you know, it's more than whew. We know, let's not get in. Okay, all right. Let's be on, be on task. The story is we go down rabbit holes here now, so. but. You know, and so, you know, finally, you know, can you, even though Juneteenth is happening, Black folks are coming together, they're celebrating some of the first things that they're doing, they're seeking out family, they are buying land, they are, um, they're reconnecting. There's also a very, a very, un, you know, very unfortunate part of this and a pragmatic part of this. Some of them remain on the plantations because they have no other means of 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 of, of, of sustenance and living. So right. maybe some of them go right back into some of the situ into the, some of the situations for some of the even argue even worse because it's a share crop. Right. Right. Um right. at the same point in time, you know, they they're increasing their literacy rates faster than any other racial group in the Absolutely. history of if we are as recording literacy rates, you know? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So this idea that black folks don't want to read and everything like that, you know, we could throw that out the window. But mm -hmm. these are the things that are happening. But something, someone also told me this, um, well, not told me, I read this, that a lot of Confederate, a lot of Confederate slaveholders, you know, took their talents to the South, like, as in Brazil to continue their yes. way of life, yes. right? Yes. And so yes. before we leave, can you just speak to that a little bit? And, and, and so we could, you know, give people thought about um, that Juneteenth is very multi, is very multifaceted. So, yeah. It absolutely is. It's, it's, it's as with anything um, dealing with history, there's a lot of dynamics going on. Right. So for example, there, um, if, People are interested, they can go to the Federal Writers Project that was conducted by um, Congress and look up some of the um, narratives of, of people in Texas. And there's one of this young girl who was taken away from her family and to, I believe it was Georgia. And then here comes um, the Civil War and she travels across the country back to Texas looking for her mother, okay? So one of the things that we have to realize is that with the um, Civil War, one of the utmost important things was the reuniting of families, right? Right. No matter where they are, even if in, in Texas where people did not know that they were free yet, but it, ironically, and I remember this one thing in her story, was she was afraid to go to Texas because she didn't know what the situation was. Mm -hmm. And she was told by um, someone manning a boat um, that, and I'm paraphrasing here, that she had nothing to worry about because she was free. So it's not that white people did not know the Emancipation Proclamation was passed. They just failed to tell the yes. people that they needed to tell yeah. because they were like milking the labor. But she um, went back to Texas to look for her mother. And so that's one of the things that comes out of, of the war, the reuniting of Black families. The, that was yeah. utmost importance. Not only the reuniting of Black families, but the right, the right to marry who you wanted, right? 
and to rebuild that community. Um, and so I think in the spirit of that, Black people are realizing that we don't have to make excuses for wanting to find our families. I mean, look at how many people are researching their genealogies now. Yeah. Right? Look at how many people are like that family, uh, that one man who went back to the South and bought the land that his family worked. Right. He didn't know. And And he didn't even know. You know, there was a part in that that well, I was like, this is amazing. There was a part in there that really, it hit me hard in a mm-hmm. way that I was uncomfortable because um, maybe the, the, you know, the sense, the white descendant felt it was, you know, he was doing a good thing by saying this, but he told the black guy, welcome home. Right. <laughs> yeah, they go, right. They know how I feel about that. <laughs> like I would, I would have felt, a certain kind of a way. Right, you know, right. You know, so, so I, I, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's power in understanding your past. Mm-hmm, and, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, there's a reason why, you know, um, I'm currently working on, the, as you know, the Black Studies curriculum. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm part of an amazing team that's doing that work for New York City. And New York State doesn't have an ethnic studies class at all mm. in K-12 until this curriculum, right? right? Right. And so we think about other states that that have mm-hmm. that. and um Absolutely. as as, mm-hmm. as Texas is, you know, and we could talk about the difference between enslaved people and raising um migrants. Right, right, migrants, right. Migrants, right? Um they have they have an ethnic studies program. They have ethnic studies classes that they offer from K to twelve. So mm-hmm. You know, I, I, what I would like to, you know, what I would like to close off by saying, I know I'm hoping we don't go over time. If you do, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> it, was, it was well worth it. Um, yeah, that's, I have to work on that. Still. Um, I would say, I would, I would, I would, I would, you know, encourage our listeners to think about it in, in the context of, you know, what we are doing, not we as in, we as in the collective people, um, mm-hmm in the United States of America and in the diaspora, right, are always looking to each other for inspiration, for ideas. And so when Absolutely. I think about, when I think about um, other aspects of our life that are already having these kinds of synergies in terms of the arts and culture, you know, mm-hmm. and we look at the, we look at the, the manifestation of Afrobeats, which is, which is a, a fusion of, of, of R and B and, 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 mm-hmm. and, and um, reggae dance store and soca music and and um, and we look at and we look at um, we, you know I'm looking at I'm thinking about some another genre of music right you know we look at Af- the Afro punk music and we're looking at oh, and the Godfather of Afro punk is is, is Fela Kuti but Fela's inspiration is being drawn from from the Black struggle but also mm-hmm. to his inspiration from 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 African American jazz musicians. And even Absolutely. in the great world. So like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, you know, we have, you know, we are, pop, we are putting all our energy into, in, in, into the cultural parts of it. So, you know, Amakako Bao says revolutions don't occur without the culture, right? Right, um, right, right. But, you know, are we, you know, maybe, you know, we need to start looking at um, the political formations in that global context, because, you know, that was something that historically was happening before. That Absolutely. On a, on a scale. Absolutely. I feel like the same way African American communities were influenced by global events, that individuals in other countries are influenced by events occurring here in Black communities in the United States. And so one of those things is when we look at the George, the protests for George Floyd and the activism that took place. You know, I, I don't know how many people were surprised to see that these protests are going on, especially when we talk about Africa, you have them going on in Kenya, you have them going on in South Africa, you have them going on in Brazil, you have them going on in North in South Korea, you have them going on in Taiwan. It's a global phenomenon. Black because, London and black and black Dutch folks, black exactly. French folks. New Zealand, yeah, 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 yeah. Because again, we can be free, but we're not free until we are seen as full citizens before the law. And so 
it, it's 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 like this reciprocal energy that's going on in the world, especially with the past what eight years. Yeah. Yes, eight years. Because on one side you have this extreme um, extremist um, racism going on, and this you know. Um, but then also on the other side you have black and brown people saying, "You can say what you want, but I ain't going for it anymore." Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and I think yeah, I'm, I'm you know I'm liking where we are in that space now. Um, exactly. And it's and you could see it being manifested not just in our politics, but you see it manifesting in all aspects of our lives, how we show up. Absolutely. Our aesthetic and and you know who we decide to patronize and put our monies into. You know, Absolutely. Those things are happening in, in a way that um, it's taken some time because you know and I'll you know close off by saying, you know, when I think about Juneteenth, I also think I go through the speeches of Booker T. Washington mm-hmm. and, and controversially. And, you know, when he was, when he was speaking against, you know, even though he, the Atlanta compromise was a tactical move that ultimately did not help, um, didn't help the cause. And he saw that eventually, um, mm-hmm. When he was, he wrote in the newspaper. I can't remember the newspaper's name. Against the the um, Plessy Ferguson decision, right, right. You know, he spoke about the role. You know, black folks picking themselves up by the bootstraps, even forming all black towns, and, absolutely, and, and 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 doing the things, and, and and not, and you know, trying to trying to live the you know, trying to live their full potential with. You know, without any handouts, oftentimes, mm-hmm. and yet still, he spoke about constantly having to deal with racial terror, Absolutely. right, and the lynchings. And so, when you speak about the full citizenship, part of the full citizenship comes with protections under the law. Absolutely. And so, we're probably going to have, a, you know, have to have a second conversation about this at some point in time. Mm-hmm. But this was absolutely wonderful having you on on board. Um, and having this conversation. I do hope um, we can have these conversations in, in continuation. Um, Dr. West, Dr. Cummings, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. And, thank you for um, having me and inviting me. It was my pleasure. Oh, it was, it was certainly my <laughs> pleasure. And to the viewers, I do hope that um, we provided um, a different context into Juneteenth. And um, you can reach us. Um, I am Brooklyn Jacobins on Twitter. And Dr. Dr. Cummings, you are? At SVC Cummings on Twitter. Okay. All right. And you can also catch me on, on, on Instagram, on Pan African Jacobins also too. Mm-hmm. Um, and on, on Instagram, you are? I believe it's at Island Butterfly. Okay. Or you can try at SVC Scholar as well. All right, that's what's up. Everyone, <laughs> enjoy your June teens. Enjoy, celebrate, but reflect. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.